Hello, <clears throat> my name is Kendall Lamke and I chair the Department of Agronomy at Iowa State University. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about 40 years of plant breeding. First, I, order, I owe a thank you uh, to all those involved with me being the 2020 recipient of the National Association of Plant Breeders Pu Public Sector Plant Breeding Impact Award. Truly an honor to receive this award and I want to thank Jin Ming Yu for nominating me, the, of course the folks who wrote the reference letters and um, as well as the awards committee at NAPB. Uh, it was an award that I did not expect to receive and, and getting an award like this from your peers really is an honor. I, I do appreciate it. I also want to thank all the plant breeders at Iowa State University. Uh, here's a list of them on, on this slide here. Fortunately, like someone like Bill Beavis have retired recently, and I've had a chance over the last 15 years as department chair to hire a lot of these plant breeders. So even though I haven't been active in plant breeding, I have had impact in other ways. For example, I've hired Bill Beavis, I've hired Danny Singh, Artie Singh, Walter Souza, Jin Ming Yu, Thomas Luberstead, and, and maybe a couple of others, the C.B. Mahama, maybe a couple of others who, who aren't on this slide um, anymore. So it's a pleasure to have them in our program. I am still a strong supporter of cultivar development programs. We have three right now at Iowa State, Maria Salas' program in biomass sorghum, Danny Singh's program in soybean, Artie Singh's program in mung bean and herb bean. And you could say Thomas Liverstead's program in developing double hat plate inducers as well. I want to talk about my graduate student years because I think it's informative and and I think shaped who I eventually became, not completely, uh, but, but had a big impact on me, certainly as a graduate student mentor. I was a reluctant undergraduate. I wanted to stay home and farm. That wasn't possible um, in 1976. So I ended up going to the University of Illinois and I majored in ag, I started out as a major in ag engineering for almost two years. I discovered agronomy that looked like something that was closer to what I wanted to do because my big goal in life was to impact farmers. If I couldn't farm, then I wanted to be in a position to impact farming. And at first, ag engineering looked like a way to do that. It probably was. And But plant breeding also looked like a good way to do that as well. So I went, changed my major to agronomy, went over and got an advisor. My advisor happened to be an alfalfa breeder, Daryl Miller. Um, Daryl Miller introduced me to John Dudley. John Dudley hired me as an undergrad and kind of the rest is history. And so John Dudley became my took the risk of taking me as a master's student in his program in 1980. Um, John got his MS and P BS at Purdue and his MS and PhD at Iowa State University in 1955 and 1956 in plant breeding with C.P. Wilsey. Uh, he was trained as, a, as an alfalfa breeder and that information will be of relevance here a little later. Here's a picture of of John with some of his, and some of his students, including me in 2002 at the long-term selection conference. I just want to show a fun picture. It's kind of nice to see who some of John's students were. The gentleman standing right to John's right, John Miles, and John Miles had a big impact on me because I worked for John as an undergraduate as he was getting his PhD with John. <clears throat> John is a Rocky area breeder uh, down at Summit. I, I believe he's retired now. And you may know some of the other people in this picture. Well, through my master's thesis, I had time to read, think, and study. I really did appreciate that. Uh, when, I, when I became a graduate student, I wasn't sure what to do. John told me I should read. I asked him what to read. He told me, and I went and read it. And, um, and so I had a lot of time to do a lot of reading. I left my master's program believing I was pretty well read. Of course, I wasn't as well read as I thought it was, but I, but I was pretty well read. Um, John was a great teaching role model. He's a voracious reader. Uh, these are all characteristics that you know I was trying to emulate. He's an excellent writer, excellent editor. He's a patient human being. I think all plant breeders are patient. And I learned a lot from him from auto -tetra about auto tetrapoid genetics. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I worked on auto tetrapoid genetics uh, for my master's thesis, mass selection, inbreed depression, and three auto tetrapoid maize synthetics. So, so we had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun at University of Illinois. It was a fun place to be at the time. I ended up leaving Illinois to go to the University of Iowa State University to get my PhD degree. I had my choice of working with either this man, Arnold Hallauer, or Bill Russell. Either of them would have been excellent choices. I ended up working with Dr. Hallauer because of my interest in quantitative genetics that I developed from working with Dr. Dudley. Arnold also got his BS 
his MS and PhD degrees at Iowa State University in 1958 with George Sprague in 1960 uh, with Bill Russell because George Sprague had left in 58 to, um, to, to move to, with the USDA to uh, DC to head up the Corn and Cereal Investigations Unit at what's now the USDA. Um, so you can see now that John and Arnold are both contem are contemporaries, but they didn't overlap at Iowa State, um, but they have Iowa State as a connection. And here's a picture uh, circa 1985 from our project at Iowa State University um, uh, with Dr. Hall R there in the center of the picture. Um, that's me um, on the left side of the picture, of course, and the leather vest. And right behind Arnold is Linda Pollock who was with the ARS. She had just recently been hired into the USDA program at the time um, and is now retired. My PhD program was a lot different than my master's program. We worked like dogs. We must have planted, been planting in, in uh, early 1982 through about 1985, probably 20 to 30 acres of plots and nursery a year and hand harvesting it. It was a lot of work. So I didn't have the time to think and read, at least during the daytime hours. So you had to take what time there was to read, think and study. I'm not saying it wasn't fun because it was. Um, it was just a different kind of fun. And you had to spend your time a lot different. Arnold, like Dr. Dudley, was also a voracious reader. He still is. I'm sure they both are. Uh, he was an excellent writer, and he was an excellent editor, and he was also a patient human being. And I learned a lot from him as well, and because there's a lot of overlapping, overlapping interests. Both of these gentlemen would turn something you give them to read around in the evening, almost always. Uh, that was, that's probably considered miraculous this day and age, but, uh, but, but they were both able to do it and did do it. So these two gentlemen, both Studley and Hall Hour, were connected by George Sprague. George Sprague was also at the University of Illinois while I was there after he retired. That's where he spent his retirement years. And I don't think he ever really did slow down. I consider this kind of an iconic photo. Um, George Sprague there in the middle of the back with the arrow over him. To his, to his right is Earl Patterson and to his left is John Dudley. On the front from left to right is Bob Lambert, Art Hooker, a plant pathologist, Denton Alexander, and of course John Lonnan who was the one that developed Illinois super sweet sweet corn. He was the geneticist in the biology department. And George was the foundation of the, and, well, he wasn't really the person who started the Iowa State Maize Program. Um, the Iowa State Maize Breeding Program was started by Merle Jenkins. Sprague replaced Jenkins when Jenkins moved to DC. But Sprague was the person who I think ties all these people together, including John and um, and Arnold and me and had a lot of influence I think on in how all of us thought about maize breeding at the time. I consider George Sprague to be one of the best writers and thinkers ever in maize breeding. I have the honor I believe of being maybe the only person I don't think I don't know anybody else who's who has the pictures of their both of their major advisors on shot glasses. Um, both of these are from International Symposi Plant Breeding Symposiums held in Mexico City. These are tequila shot glasses. So I thought I'd show that in. I was able to find them. Um, and uh, so I thought that was a nice little tidbit to add to the talk today. Another thing that connects them. I want to point out another gentleman who's been influential in my career, Charlie Singh, who also is connected through Iowa State University. Charlie's a um, from Illinois originally got his BS degree in agronomy in my department at Iowa State University in 1960. His master's in wheat breeding with Elmer Heine at K-State. His um, PhD in genetic statistics with Bob Mall at North Carolina State. Charlie went on to become the first one, the first human geneticist hired in the human genetics department at the University of Michigan. He worked primarily on the quantitative genetics of coronary heart disease and hypertension there. I met Charlie at a field day probably 25 years ago, a popcorn field day in, in Ames here. Charlie has got royalties from popcorn and bread lines, which is something I can't claim to have been able to do. Uh, but, and so Charlie's been a very influential person in my career. Um, he started his career, well, his PhD was on inbreeding depression. This paper here is saying Mall and Hansen, Warren Hansen, uh, inbreeding of, in two populations of maize. And then I think probably one of the best studies I did during my career was quantitative genetics inbreeding in synthetic maize population with Jody Edwards 
and which is kind of a follow-up to that study and actually a follow-up to some work that both Arnold and uh, John Dudley had done as well. Uh, Charlie, the influence that Charlie's had on me came through some meetings that he held over a course of 20, 25 years, every other years in Montana at a guest ranch. It was kind of based around Wendell Berry on the left. Wendell was at every one of those meetings, as was Wes Jackson. He was sort of the basis for this meeting, but it was a place for people in human genetics and agriculture came together at Charlie's invitation to discuss uh, philosophy, if you will, in both agriculture, medicine, and research. I learned a lot at those meetings. I still talk to Charlie every week. In fact, I'm going to go see him in person next week. So big influence on how I think about stuff. He's an important person. Finally, I need to thank my graduate students. I wouldn't have done anything without them. I'm very proud of all my graduate students. They've gone, all gone on to do good things during their careers. And quite a few of them now work in industry someplace out there in the world. I want to take some time to, to talk about some of my corn breeding career. Uh, things have changed a lot since I started in plant breeding. I'm not going to talk about that so much, but, but what we did, we worked primarily on five things, population improvement, selection response, epistasis, inbreeding, inbreeding depression, and heterosis. Um, and um, I think we did some pretty important work in, in all of those areas, and we'll highlight some of that now. We did a lot of work with Iowa Stiff Stock Synthetic, BSSS, as we sometimes call it, 16 line synthetic that George Sprague started putting together when he's at Missouri before moving to Ames in the 30s. The population is still around. We're still doing selection in it. It was it's unique. It's a unique population. There's no other way of saying it. Uh, it's a source of several important inbreds. Didn't respond to inbred progeny selection, even though everybody thought it should. Certainly Steve Everhart thought it should have. Um, Responded very well to reciprocal recurrent selection. Has equal additive and dominance variance as every variance study has ever done shown that. Uh, contrary to say open pollinated varieties, almost every other synthetic, the additive variance is easily two times or more the dominance variance. Additive variance didn't decrease with selection in this population. Reciprocal recurrent selection did decrease dominance variance significantly though, and uh, had a unique variance component structure as Jody found out in his PhD dissertation. Uh, and that, this is one of the papers out of Jody's PhD dissertation. I, I'm going to use it just because I think it's probably one of the best experiments that I was ever been involved with design and execution wise. Jody ran and it came out so well because he ran simulation models on genetic design experiment. He extended and applied new theory around inbreeding. We grew 200 lines in each of five generations, 1,000 entry study, two reps, six locations, total environments. 12,000 plots. It was a beast. And, uh, and we used a novel experimental design that worked out really well that Jody and I had come up to uh, conduct this experiment in. Um, what did I learn from that study? The modeling and theory paid off. It was worth the time and effort. Having good questions, I think, is always important. And understanding the precision with which we could estimate some of the parameters we were interested in was quite important to us, too. I learned I was wrong about a lot, too, of what I thought I knew about inbreeding and inbreeding depression. I was interested in the variance of F and also into the variance of the rate of inbreeding depression. The rate of inbreeding, it should say depression, my apologies, is confounded with the SO individual breeding value Jody was able to demonstrate to me. I did not know that. Basically, that meant that individuals with large breeding values are going to inbreed more than individuals with small breeding values. Of course, large breeding values for things like yield are what plant breeders want. We learned that stiff stalk had a negative covariance structure between breeding values and dominance deviations of inbred individuals. We call this D1. And this led to lower variance among inbred progeny breeding values and hence reduced response to inbred progeny selection. So we were able to explain some things we didn't understand. And uh, we had a lot of fun. The other Nice piece of work Jody and I did, which I won't go through in detail, is the paper, of just, which was not part of his uh, PhD dissertation that we wrote for the Heterosis Conference. It was also held in Mexico City in 1988, I believe. The paper was published in 89, where we laid out a new framework for looking at heterosis that was based on some uh, previous work that had been done, where we were trying to separate panmictic heterosis from the recovery of, from heterosis that results from the recovery of inbreeding depression. There's a lot of reasons I was interested in that, and uh, which I will write about um, after I step down as chair in three or four years, uh, because I think it, there's still some misunderstandings about this, but this is 
been an interesting paper for us. The question is, is did it all matter? I think it did. Um, we were able to, add, we had questions, you know, we were curious. Uh, we were able to answer some of those questions and, and learn about things. Uh, we were able, and we were, I was able to train a lot of really good graduate students. I think in the end, it's all about people uh, as well. And, and I was, I'm, most, I'm very proud of the graduate students, postdocs and visiting scientists who I didn't list, uh, worked with over the years and, and what they're doing and the, the influence we may have had on, on those people while they were here. You look at my most cited papers, you know, is, is that a measure of, of impact? I, I don't think so, although the heterosis one does come up on the list, which makes um, makes me happy. The, the 2002 paper of Jody did not make that list. Most of the stuff that's highly, that I have that was cited a little bit was, was old R, RFLP and SSR work that we were doing uh, with Mike Lee at the time. <clears throat> Almost everything that we did, I did during my career was was based on the bottom four parts of this pyramid, uh, germplasm, breeding methodology, data collection, and data management. Um, I put this slide together to show that almost everything that's come after that are, is built on this foundation. And, um, and of course, by the time I became department chair 15 years ago, um, I was, you know, the, these newer things were starting to really come online. And I haven't done as much work in that arena, but, but without these bottom four things, none of the stuff that, that especially large maize breeding programs are doing now, particularly would be able to do. I just wanted to kind of make that point while I'm here. I want to end with this coda from um, a paper by Ernst Mayer and PNAS called The Objects of Selection. And so Ernst wrote, he wrote a whole paper on selection and what the unit of selection was. He goes, when rereading my analysis, I was quite surprised how rarely I had to refer to the genetic aspects responsible for the phenotype. Apparently, it does not matter very much how the genes are combined or how much the genotype has to be modified, provided the resulting phenotype is favored by selection. What counts is the adaptiveness of the end product. He goes on to point out that he's indebted to Richard Lewington, who just passed away this past um, um, 4th of July weekend, and Lewington was certainly one of my favorite writings on a whole bunch of things. I didn't always agree with him, but I always liked to read him. So with that, I'd like to thank you, and I think there's maybe some time for questions.